Hello, how are you? Welcome to Chapman World. In the instructional video on addressing modes, I took a sidebar to point out a problem in our simple instruction encoding from the, the model from part one. And that problem is that the simple encoding mechanism we have doesn't tell us what the addressing modes for the operands of an instruction are. So effectively the load instruction, if we just use a single byte to represent the load instruction, we've no information to tell us whether that's loading an immediate value or loading from a register. And so we need an encoding mechanism to encode that data into our instruction. Now, different manufacturers handle this in different ways. The Intel x86 line of CPUs, for example, has a very complex encoding mechanism. Because the Intel has been developing as a family of CPUs for such a long time, I think 40 years or so, each successive chip has actually supported all of the addressing modes of the previous chip, but added some new ones or added new features. And so it's become quite a complex encoding mechanism. Now in contrast, we've added a 6502 emulator to our virtual machine code, and the 6502 solves this problem by having different instructions. So it has LDA, load A, that will load a value into the A register, the accumulator. It then has LDX and LDY to load into the X and Y registers respectively. And each of those three is a different instruction with a different opcode. Now the 6502 has an opcode space of 256 possible opcodes, and I think it only uses 150 or so of them. So it's a very simple encoding mechanism in that it has a different instruction. Now what I'm going to go for in our implementation is somewhere in between. I said in part one that I didn't want to use a single byte for our opcode because 256 possible opcodes is not enough. I've some experience writing a virtual machine in the past and I ran out of instructions in my space. And so I gave it a 16-bit value. And I said that 16 bits would be more than enough. And then I went ahead and changed the code to upgrade it to 32 bits right here, this Z4 flag. This tells our opcode that it's going to be a 32-bit opcode. Now, I stand by the fact that 16 bits is more than enough for the opcodes. In fact, in the encoding mechanism that I've come up with, I'm only using 10 bits. So we'll have a possible 1,024 instructions for our virtual machine. But I'm using the remainder of those 32 bits, the remaining 22, to encode the operands, the addressing modes for the operands. So this is what I'm going to do with our opcodes. And effectively, all we need to do is be sure that our T opcode enum never exceeds 1024 possible instructions. I honestly don't think in this video series we're going to come anywhere near 1024 instructions. If we take a look at these three lines here, the bottom line is basically telling us what bit number we're at. So here we're at bit number 31. Remember, this is 32 bits indexed from zero. So this is the final bit, 31. Uh, and this is a reg, and I'm going to come back and explain what that means in a moment. And then we have bit 30 being an IDX and bit 29 being an IND, IND. So effectively what these mean are, if the reg bit is set, then we are using a register in our addressing mode. It may be register addressing, or it may be register indirect addressing, or may register indexed addressing. And that's what the remaining two bits are for. The IDX is to say whether or not it is indexed addressing, and the IND to say whether or not it is indirect addressing. So these three bits together actually give us our addressing mode. So what are the remaining bits in this operand? Well, if we specify that this is a register addressing mode, then we need to select a register. We need to tell it which register we're addressing. So what I've done is I said, let's have a four bit value to specify the registers. That basically gives us 16 possible registers. So I've labeled them here as accumulator being zero through to our program counter here at 1101. And then I've also put in these registers for stack pointer and flags. We'll come back to those in a later part. And 10 general purpose registers index zero through nine. So in the video, in the explanation video, we had G0 through, I think, G6. I'm going to go ahead and give us up to G9. And then I've reserved these last two registers. Now, I may never come back and use these. I've got several options for things that I'd like to discuss in later parts for the virtual machine. And one of those features might come back and make use of these registers. But whether or not I actually make a video on this particular feature has not been decided yet. So I'm just going to leave these two registers as reserved. So that's our 16 registers. And the way that we encode them is if the register bit here is set to a one, then the next four bits after the addressing mode, bits 28 down to 25, this will be our four bit index into the registers. So that will tell us which register we care about for this register bit. 
Now you'll remember also from the addressing modes video that we could have an index. So the register may be a base and we may be indexing another register on top of that base. And that is what the next four bytes are for. That's going to tell us what the next register is, the index register, if we're using, say, register indexed addressing mode. And then I've basically repeated this in bits 20 down to bit 10. And this is for the second operand. So I've effectively got enough space in a 32 bit instruction here to encode two operands and a 10 bit opcode to tell us what instruction we're going to be executing. Now there are a few little caveats that we need to look at. So uh, for example, the instructions here, they can always have two operands. It is necessary to always encode two operands. So what do we do if we have an instruction that doesn't have two operands? Let's say NOP is an instruction with no operands. Well, for the missing operands, we're simply going to encode the implied mode addressing mode. So it's implied by the instruction what that opcode does. And if that opcode is not required, then the instruction simply implies that it is not required. So whenever we have the NOP instruction then, so I think the NOP instruction code is zero, if I remember rightly, I've got it right here. It's actually zero one. So if we come across our zero one NOP instruction, then it would be encoded with zero one being in these last 10. And then we're going to encode the implied mode. So if I look down my list of modes here, where did I put it? Special case here, implied mode. So we're going to encode 010 into the first and second operands addressing mode bits. So that way we don't actually have to provide any operands for our NOP instruction. Now the other part of having two encodable operands is that there is always going to be a source and a target. I believe I called it target rather than destination. So I'm going to specify that operand one is always the source operand and that operand two is always the target. So if we have an instruction that only has a source operand or that only has a target operand, then whichever operand is not required will also be encoded as an implied mode operand. Now taking a look at the bits of our addressing modes, all but this one special case makes sense with the bit meaning. So for example, here we have register bit set zero. So this is not register addressing. We have index zero, so we don't have an index register and this is not indirect. In other words, this is immediate mode. So if it's not a register, then we're getting an immediate value. It's not an indexed value. It's not an indirect value. It is immediate mode. And they all decode in this way. They all decode just fine, except for the special case of implied mode. Essentially, I could have added an additional bit to say whether this operand was implied or not. But if I added that additional bit, I have to take it from somewhere. And that would have either been from the register encoding or the opcode. So what I decided instead was to take one of the patterns of bits for the addressing mode and make that the special case. So this would have been immediate indexed, not indirect. So in other words, we'd have had an immediate value plus some value from a register, and that would give us our result. I decided of these modes, that was the probably the one with the fewest use cases. And so that's the one that I decided to usurp for our implied mode. Okay, so let's quickly review my notes at the bottom here. Note one, all instructions have two operands. When an operand is not required, it's set to 010, the implied mode. Uh, note two, the base register and index register for any opcode may not be the same register. And then we're gonna take a look at this note three, which says when immediate bit is set and it is not the special case of the implied mode, a 64 bit value follows the opcode for each operand which requires such a value. In other words, if we are in immediate mode, well, then we need a 64 bit immediate value to load into our register. And if we have two operands that are both immediate mode, then we need two of these 64 bit values. Now in register mode, that doesn't apply. If we're specifying a register right here in the bits of the instruction, then nothing needs to follow in order to tell us which register we're going to use. It's encoded in the instruction. Now, because we're going to be decoding bits from a 32-bit value, I've also put some masks and shifts together here. These are constants that we can copy paste into our code to give us access to the various parts that we need. So you can see here, the first three bits are set in this operand one mode. So that's the addressing mode for operand one. And then we have its register specifier, the first register specifier, and then the index register specifier. And then we're on to operand two, and it's the next three bits that give us the mode for this operand. 
So you can see that I've built these masks up so that we can mask out of the instruction the values that we need. And then if we do want to get the mode out, so we take, want to take these three bits out, well then there are 29 remaining bits here. So when we look at this value, rather than compare it to this actual value directly, we can do a shift right to shift all of these 29 bits down and put them in the end of the mode here. So that is an option that will give us the ability to do a case selection on our addressing modes. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy all of our constants and our enum out of this uh, template here and we'll put this into our source. Let's maximize this up now. And we're going to go ahead and find a place in here to put our decoding constants. So this is our run method. I think I'll put them right at the top here. So these are the values reflected in the three bits of the addressing mode. Okay, so I have those constants and enums in. And the first thing that I'm going to want to change here is the uh, program counter. So let's go and take a look at our program counter. So at the moment, if we look at our CPU state, we have just the program counter and accumulator. Well, I've changed things so that we now have 16 different registers. And so we could keep their names in as they are here and address them individually, but I think it would be nicer to have them as an array. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a registers array. And that's going to be of t register value. Okay, so what that means is that our program counter and our accumulator are now a part of that array. So I'm going to take our variables out here, and that's going to break the code. So I'm going to go through, and everywhere the code is broken, I'm going to fix it. So right here, you can see we're addressing the program counter. So I'm going to change this for my constant now. We're going to go for state.registers, and then I'll put in reg. Uh, PC for the program counter. So if we come and take a look back at the constants, I've got reg PC. So this is the index into that array for the program counter. I'm going to have to do the same thing everywhere I've used the accumulator. So I'm going to go ahead and speed up the footage while I make those changes. Okay, so I've made those changes everywhere that we were using the accumulator or the program counter. I've gone through and replaced it with the uh, registers array indexed by whichever register we were trying to address. So with that done, let's come and take a look at our state record. This is where we're going to need to make our next change. So we have our registers. Now our handlers could go and look in each of these registers, but our handler isn't always going to be given a register addressing mode. It might be an immediate mode. And so what we really need in our handler is a pointer to whatever object it is that we are trying to address. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to come in and put in a source pointer. So I'll call it source SRCPTR, short for source pointer. And we'll make this a P register value. Now I don't know if I've defined that type. So yes, I have. It's right here. So this is a pointer to a register value. So we're always going to be pointing at a uint64. This is what this pointer is. And that's where we're going to get our source for the instruction. And then TGTPTR, target pointer, is going to be P register value. And actually, just for good measure, I think I'm going to make these variable names longer just to make it clear what they do. Okay, now that's going to point at whatever it is that we want to address. If this is a register addressing mode operand, then we'll be pointing at a register in the registers array. If it is a memory location, then indirect, then we'll be pointing at that memory location. But there is one combination of opcode and operands which can't be encoded in a pointer. And that is if we have an indexed register. Okay, so if we get the pointer to the register and then we're indexing from some other register, we could go pull the value of that other register out and add it to the register value that we have. But we don't want to actually adjust the registers with it. Okay, we just want the result of the two registers being added together. So what we need to do is point at the register we care about or the address that we care about, and then have an offset that can be added by the handler. So what I'm going to do is add two more parameters here. Okay, so with those two offsets, we can now point at some location and then say, I also want you to offset by x amount if we need to. I think we need those two values. I'll find out as I'm 
building the code out, S-O-U. There we go. So I'll find out as we're building the code out, but I think we'll need those. So these actually are going to be for our handlers. And the handlers basically shouldn't really need to work with the registers directly any longer because they'll be provided with a pointer to the relevant register. But I'm going to leave the registers in this data type here, in this chappy state type, because I'm actually thinking of moving this type to the API level so that we can use that on instruction handler to inspect the registers as the program progresses. So now let's go back down to our run method and see how we might decode these instructions. This is where we're getting a handler for our instruction. Well, we can't do it quite like this anymore. We do still need to get a handler, but we need to get a handler based on an opcode that we're going to decode out of that 32-bit value. So what we need is a 32-bit instruction value. Okay, so we'll get the instruction value from memory first. Okay, if we dereference this pointer, well, we need to cast it all as a pointer. Pointer and dereference it. And I want to get a uint32 result from that casting. So this is particularly ugly, but this is, that's going to get us our 32 bit instruction value. We're going to take this out for a moment. We need to come back and patch that up. So the first thing we need to do is pull out the, uh, opcode from our instruction. So that's the easy part. We're going to do opcode is equal to t opcode of the instruction. And then we need to use a mask. And I've forgotten all of my mask names. So I'll go and take a look in the document here. And we have mask opcode. So we're going to mask this value and mask opcode. We don't need to do any bit shifting. That's just going to give us the opcode. So that means up here, we're going to want instead of p opcode, which is a data type, we don't need that any longer. We just have opcode and it's going to be a t opcode. Okay, so with the opcode decoded, we can also now fetch our handler. That's going to be c instruction set opcode. Now we need to get the addressing mode of each of the operands. I'm going to, the code for this is going to be quite similar for the source and the target operand. And I think what I'm going to do is actually have it copy pasted. You see, I could make this a function and just pass in whatever variables need to change for operands one and two. But I think that they're going to have some discrete properties that we need to care about. And they also have different uh, values in the state record that they're going to address. So I think what I'll do is I'll decode the source operand first. And then we'll copy paste that and change it out for the target. Okay, so we have this region and the first thing we want is the addressing mode. Basically, I'm going to use a local variable here for the addressing mode and then reuse it when I decode operand two. And the reason is that the only thing we really need left over at the end of this decoding is the pointer and the offset that we care about. So I'm basically going to decode it and then reuse the same variable. So we'll have uh, addressing mode up in here. And then we need to pull the addressing mode out of the instruction. Well, I've got masks for doing that. So let's take a look at those. So operand one's addressing mode is at this mask. But if I just use the mask, then I don't get the full addressing mode. Okay, that's incomplete. Now, there's a couple of different ways we could approach the problem of decoding the addressing modes. I could use a nested series of if then else, if then else. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. With the three bits we've got here, I could say if the register bit is set, then uh, if it's not set, then that would be the else. If the index is set, then else. So I could do this nested series of if then else on the three different conditions of the addressing mode, or I could use a case statement to identify each of these modes. Now I decided to go with a case statement, and I know that I said in part one that case statements aren't particularly efficient. And so this could be changed out later to be a series of if else. However, there are only what eight cases here, eight different addressing modes. So this isn't a particularly large number for us to deal with. And so I'm going to go ahead and use a case statement because it's not going to be particularly bad performance. We could go back and optimize this out later if we want to, but I'm going to use a case statement here. Okay. In order to use a case statement, this is why this is different. Let me come back to the, uh, do the document here. The reason this is different is if I just wanted to find out if the register bit is set, then I could mask the register bit and do a comparison on the mask. And that would tell me whether the bit is set or not. I don't need to do any shifting. I can just use logical and operators. But because we are doing this as a case statement, 
I need to move those three bits, this uh, addressing mode bit, I need to move them down to these last three bits. So I need to use my shift mode to shift them right. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so that's going to get the uh, addressing mode for me. And it needs to be cast as a T addressing mode. Now, in theory, I could just use this as another possible optimization. For this one case, I could just do the shift right. I don't have to mask this out. And the reason is, if we come back to our uh, bitmap here, if we take a look at all these bits, if I shift these three down to the right, well, all the bits that come in when you do a shift are zeros. So I would have nothing but zeros all the way down to the last three bits, and then my three bits would be the addressing mode. Unfortunately, that doesn't remain true for operand two. If I don't clear out all of these bits, then I could have ones in there, and as I shift it down, they'll remain in there. They'll just be moved along with everything else. So in order to keep the code consistent between operands one and two, that's why I'm doing the mask and shift on this. But there is yet another optimization that we could do. Okay, so we need a case statement. Case addressing mode of. And this is where we come to another potential problem. Now, in the source operand, an immediate value is something that you can load. It doesn't make sense to have an immediate value for a target operand because the immediate value is already set. It's essentially a constant. And so writing to a constant doesn't make any sense. So we're going to need some error conditions for modes that don't make sense. Immediate mode in this case does. So let's go ahead and implement it. In immediate mode, our first parameter, our first operand, is immediately after the instruction. And we've just read the instruction from the program counter, but we've not yet updated that program counter beyond the instruction. So let's go and get the increment of our program counter and pull it back so that it's after we decode the opcode from the instruction. So now our program counter is pointing at the immediate next value. I'm going to come in here and say our f state dot source pointer is going to be set to the memory location. So f state dot memory at address zero, which we have to cast as a native uint, native uint, so that we can do arithmetic on it, plus the program counter f state dot registers. I want register program counter. And so that is going to give us the actual location as a native uint, but this wants to be a pointer. OK, so we now have our source pointer and we want to set our program counter. We want to increment it again because we are now going to be beyond that immediate value. So if we come to decode operand two, it's going to want to know what address the instruction or the immediate can be found at. So we need to increment our program counter again. And this time we're going to increment it by the size of T register value rather than 32 bits as we did for the opcode. So that's our immediate mode already done. But there is one other thing that I've missed. And that is that the source offset, well, if there was a previous instruction that set the offset, I'm now going to get that offset as well for my next instruction. I need to zero that out. So we actually need some initialization up in here. OK, so we're now nilling out and zeroing out all of those values, and we don't have to worry about having vestiges from our previous instruction cycle. OK, so now we're on to immediate indirect. OK, well, this one's going to be fairly similar. So we are still getting an immediate value. So I'm going to come up here and get the exact same code. But this is indirect. So this pointer at the moment is pointing at the value in program memory. What I actually want it to do is to point to the location in memory that is specified by this address. So we need to decode this value from our program. And I think we can do it by taking off the pointer. No, we actually want this to remain a pointer, but we are going to dereference it as a uint64, no, a t register value. So what we're getting here is a register value. That gives us the register, it's not actually a register, but a register sized value from the immediate position in memory after the instruction. And that value is the 
index into our virtual memory space. I could make this line longer and longer, or I could give us a temporary variable here. So I'm going to give us a temporary variable just to make things a little bit easier. So the effective address that we want is stored in program memory. And the pointer is going to be, now this has to be, uh, the effective address, remember, is inside our virtual machine's addressing space. But this pointer is in our host's addressing space. So we need to address this memory array again. So that's going to give us a pointer to the base of that memory. We again need to cast it, native uint, so that we can do our arithmetic on it. We're going to add the effective address. And then we're going to cast that all back to a pointer. And that gives us our source location. And then again, because we've read a register sized value from the program memory, we increment the pointer. OK, so implied mode. We don't do anything for implied mode. So we can take that case out. Immediate indirect indexed. Well, this is our immediate indirect. So let's copy that. And this is indexed by a register. So what we need to do is find out which register uh, we're being indexed by. So this effective address remains the same. This is the base of the indexed operation. We then need to add to that the value from whichever register we're decoding. So we need to decode a register. Let's take a look at how we do that. So our registers are encoded into these banks here. And I have register index one, register index two. So this register index one is for the base register, which we don't have in this case because we are using an immediate index. So what we want is this register two. This is going to be the index register. So the index register is going to get me these three bits right here. If I do a mask, it's going to get me actually four bits. I'm crossing the boundary there on the bytes. So it's going to get the four bits when we do a mask on it. And then we need to shift that down to get the register constant, this index. So how many bits do we need to shift it? So we need to shift this by one, two, three, four, five. So that's 16, uh, 21 bits. So we need to shift this right by 21 bits to get it down to the bottom here so that we can read it. OK, well, I don't believe I put in a shift constant for this. So I'm going to mark where I am in the source and come up and find my shift constants here. And we're going to say shift operand one register index two. And we want to shift by 21, which is one five, as I've done above there. Now that doesn't make sense because I'm already shifting uh, 21 bits for operand 2's addressing mode. And so operand 1's register index can't be in the same place. Let's go and take a look and make sure I got that right. So I want register index 2, which has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 16, plus 5 is 21. So that's correct, 21 bits. This mode here, we want to shift by 8, 9, 10. So we only want 10 bits. I got that index wrong, and we should correct that. Mode here, this should be 10, and this should be 0a. So we're going to come down here, and we're going to say that the instruction and this mask is going to get us the index register that we care about. And then we're going to shift that right by this shift constant. And that's going to give us a number, an index for our register. Now, uh, let's go ahead and get a reg IDX variable up here. And I can fit this into a uint 8. So we'll do that. So this is going to be reg IDX is, and that's going to get us that value. Now, we need to look at that actual register to add its value to the effective address. So we're going to go ahead and do f state dot registers as indexed by reg idx. And we're going to add that to. So now our effective address contains the location in memory that we care about. And I've typoed that one. And we can load that into the source pointer and then advance the, the program counter by the immediate value. OK, we've got a few more modes to go. So we're going to go for uh, register mode. So in register addressing mode, we want to get, as we did here, a register index. But there is no immediate value involved. 
and we don't have to update the program counter because there's no immediate value. So it's not similar enough that I want to copy paste this and we need to get a different register index. So let's start by creating a constant for that. So we want to get register index one. So that's this one and that's four bits. And we have, we have eight, 16, 24, 25 bits to do our shift. So let's go ahead and put a shift constant in for it. I'm going to mark where I'm at. So we want to shift register index one on this occasion. And what did I say? 25. So that's one nine. So that'll shift our register one down the base register down. So we'll come back here and basically we want to get our register index like this, but we're going to modify the constants that we use to shift it. So I'm interested in register index one and I'm going to shift it down for register index one. So that's going to give us the register index that we're interested in. And then our source pointer is pretty easy. F state is uh, sorry, source pointer is f state dot registers and we're going to index by reg index or reg idx and then we just want the address of that and that gives us our register mode addressing okay register indirect okay so register indirect is going to be similar this uh, f state dot register indirect is going to be similar so let's go ahead and put that in uh, so we're going to get the index of the register that we care about and instead of using a pointer to it we're going to get a pointer so we're going to do an effective address calculation again so we get our effective address here so our effective address is going to be oh that's an addition sorry so our effective address is going to be a register sized value because the addresses are going to be the same size as registers native uh, pointer native uint of the base of memory the state registers we don't want the program counter any longer we want reg idx so that's going to get the effective address of the value in the register and then this becomes the effective address so let's see where did i use effective address before it was up here so in here i was doing the base memory plus the effective address so i should be able to copy paste that and that gives us our register indirect and then we go on to register indirect indexed. So begin, end, and I'll take a copy of all of that because that gets us our uh, register. But to make it indirect, we need to get a second register index because it's going to be indexed rather. But to make it indexed, we need to get a second register index. So we're going to reuse this variable. We're going to come in here and whatever our second register is, we actually want register index two for the index register and shift right operand two. So that's going to pull out, that's going to pull out the second register for the first operand. Uh, and then we want to add the value at that register address to the effective address. So if we come and get this effective address is effective address plus add the register as an index and then we are decoding our effective address okay so that is register indexed we'll take register indexed this is register indirect indexed so we have our effective address which is the value that we got from the register plus the index from the second register and this is going to be Actually, I do believe I've gotten the previous instruction wrong. So this actually is register indirect indexed. So I believe this instruction here, register indexed, yes. This is where we need to use the offset parameter that I set as a side. So what we're actually getting from here, we want the value in the register. So our source is gonna be the address of the register itself. Let's comment this out. So this register index, this is the second register index. We've got our first register index but we don't want the effective address. We just want the address of the register. So our state variable F state source pointer is going to point at F state registers. And then that's going to be reg IDX. 
So we're actually getting, uh, we're pointing at the register we're interested in, and then our value will be offset by the amount in the second reg index. So we get the second reg index here, and we're going to say f state dot registers reg idx. That gives us the value we want to offset by. f state dot source offset is, and that should be that mode. So I think I've got those right. So yeah, I'm sure those uh, should work out just fine. That is our operand one. So now let's go ahead and take a look at operand two, which is effectively a copy of this code. So what I'm going to start with actually is taking this region, which decodes our operand one. And I'm going to do a copy paste of it, but instead of pasting it within the IDE, let's go ahead and make a new file actually. Okay, and I'll paste this code into this unit because what I want to do is just find anywhere that I'm using the word source and change that to target. Okay, and we're going to make sure this says operand two, and that's the next thing that we need to find. Anywhere we've got a one, we're going to search for and we're going to change that out for a two. And that effectively should leave us with the correct code for the second operand. Now, when I copy and paste this back into our source, we're going to have a couple of missing constants that we need to go apply. So I'm going to close this page and we'll go ahead and paste this code in as our operand two. And when we try to build it, we should have a couple of missing uh, constants in here. So what do we have? Oh, I removed the P opcode type when I changed how we decode the instruction. So now I don't have a way of validating that this instruction is a valid instruction. So what we'll do is T opcode and we'll change this to a pointer and dereference the pointer up here. And that should give us our T opcode. And let's see if that builds. I've got the wrong number of brackets, okay. Pointer type required. So we are taking our state memory, native uinting that, and casting the whole thing as a pointer. And then we dereference that pointer, and that gives us the opcode. Okay. Right, here's where we got some shifts that are not made available. So I need to go put the shift constants in for each of these. So I'm going to go up and find my shift constants. And I basically want the same shift constants as I had before. These are my shifts. So the same shift constants for operand two. So I'm going to come in and put operand two, and then I just need to set the values for them. So looking at our sketch, we have register one is going to be at eight plus six, so at 14 bits. So we'll go ahead and put that at 14 bits, which in hex is E. And then we also need our second register index, which is at eight, 10 bits. So that's going to be 10 bits in at zero A. Okay, so hopefully that should build, and it does. So what we've done is we've created these decoding mechanisms now, which I'm just gonna go ahead and compress up. And by the time I check this uh, code in, I will have verified that each of those actually functions as it should. And I'll also, I'll probably refactor this little code a little to make it uh, look a little nicer. But we've got our operand one and two, so that's created some pointers for us. Okay, so we come and take a look at our instruction handlers now, and handle load needs to be changed because at the moment it's loading specifically into the A register. Well, we've changed that, uh, and it's loading this value from the program counter, and we've changed that. And also our opcode decoding mechanism is incrementing the program counter for us. So we are already after the operands. We don't need to pull in or do any kind of increment on the program counter. So this whole method now is gonna change. And basically what we want to do is load a value from one place and put it in another. So let's take a look at value, T register value. If we have a source address, so state.source pointer, it's going to give us our value. So we'll do value equals dereferenced 
state source pointer and our value comes from that pointer. Okay, now if we have an offset, well that offset is actually just a value to add to the value that we've obtained. So value becomes equal to value plus state dot source offset. Okay, because we're not offsetting an address. Whenever we offset an address, we calculate the pointer to the new address in the decoding. Uh, so this is only going to change the actual value that we retrieve. And then we want to put that value into state dot target pointer. It's going to become equal to the value. Now, again, the target pointer will always be the address that we want to store something into. Because the target cannot have an immediate value, we also don't have an index because we're not going to be indexing any literal value. So let's go ahead and fix that in our decoding. So in operand 2, when we are decoding the operand here, if it's immediate, this is invalid. Okay, we can't have an immediate mode here. So we could have an immediate indirect, but it doesn't make sense to have an immediate. So what we're going to do is do a failure state at this point. We fail to decode. So I'm going to make a mark of where I'm at, and we're going to go borrow this invalid opcode. Now, realistically, we should have a different state, invalid combination of opcode and operand. But for just the moment, I'm going to go ahead and put in invalid opcode as this return value. And then we're going to exit. We're going to bomb out because we failed to decode the instruction. We do an addition here to add the source offset. We should also do an addition to add the target offset. So if we're using that mode, then we'll get the target offset added. And then our target pointer gets the value that we've loaded. Okay, so we've ended up here with what is effectively less readable code, but we don't have to decode the opcodes or the operands in every instruction handler, which is definitely a boon to be able to do that in our main loop. We don't have to rewrite the same decoding code for every uh, instruction handler. All our instruction handler will do is take the decoded, already decoded operands and make use of them. Load and save. These are kind of irrelevant now. These two instructions have the very same code, the very same operation. And the reason is, quite straightforwardly, we've changed our load instruction. Instead of being a load instruction, it's now actually a move instruction. It moves data from one place to another, which means we don't need load and save as separate instructions. I'm going to go ahead and change our code out to give us a move instruction instead of a load instruction. Okay, so this is actually going to break things in a lot of different places. Essentially, let's just see what we, what am I getting an error for here? Handle move. Did I not rename it? Okay, I guess I forgot to rename it. So we're going to get a, an error in a lot of different places now, and here is why. So I've changed our load instruction for a move instruction and removed the save value. And I'm actually going to change the indices for them up here. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for the addition instruction. Um, but I also have that encoder, the bytecode window that we discussed in the code review. And it now doesn't know, first of all, that the instructions have changed, that we have different named instructions. And second, it doesn't know how to do this operand encoding. And we're going to have to modify it to be able to do that. So I'm going to go ahead here and hit build and just see how badly broken everything is. So handle move, I thought I'd renamed this. Oh, I called it move move. Okay, so the first thing we've got here is I now can't load this load opcode for the Chappie bytecode interface because it doesn't know what that opcode is. And also the encode mechanism for encoding our instructions is going to be quite different. So we're going to need to make a few changes and we'll start at the interface level. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of our save instruction and we're going to come up to upload and change that to op move. So when I build this, obviously the interface is going to be broken. So we're going to come in here and change our load for a move. And we don't need a save. So I'm going to come down and find our save. Okay, there's our load. That's going to be move. And our save instruction goes away. Okay, so now we need to look at how we're encoding each of these instructions. Because at the moment what I'm doing is I am appending to the memory buffer the encoded instruction. And we get the encoded instruction from this encode method here. It's going to give us an array of bytes. 
and it takes as operands two uint64 values. Well, that's all going to have to change. We're going to need to pass in the opcode to give it the 10 bit instruction, and then two operands, and those two operands will need to contain the address mode and the register specifier and or immediate values. So I think what I'm going to do here is change this so that we do const operand one, and we'll make that a t chappy operand. And then I'm just going to go ahead and repeat that for operand two. We do require both, essentially. Now, where is encode going to get these? Encode is a private member of the chappy bytecode class. It needs to get them from the instruction encoders. Now, the halt instruction doesn't take any parameters, and I'm not going to change the interface to reflect different parameters. But move now has, uh, I don't see, we've got one operand going in there. It now has two operands. So we're going to take the same thing here, and we're going to put that on the move instruction. That's going to be const operand one, const operand two, and then that parameter list needs to be propagated back up into our interface section. So that's our move, and also into our interface. Come up to the interface level, and move will take those two operands. Okay, back in the implementation here. When we're encoding, we need to know what this tchappy operand type is. Now, at the moment, the operand type is just a uint64, which is incorrect. It should now be a record. So, what we want to put in here is addressing mode, and that needs to be a t addressing mode. And we're going to have to move that type up from the uh, implementation specifics. And then we need to have either two register specifiers or an immediate value. So I guess we could do this as a uh, union record. So we'll put in a case and we'll say boolean of, since there are two cases. And I believe when you do this in a record declaration, you remove the end. So we're going to say false. And this is going to be, and then we want true is going to be a register specifier. Now that means that we need to make some changes. Oh, let's, um, so we need to fill out these types. We're going to come back into our Chappy virtual machine and actually our register constants here. This I'm going to change into an enum and I'm going to make it an enum of size one byte. Okay, so I've turned that register specifier into an enum. We may have to do some type casting to correct for that, but I'm also going to move it up into the Chappy interface or API section here so that we can make use of it as a register specifier here. Okay, so we have our register specifier, and then there's also the addressing mode, which again, I have in the virtual CPU here, so I'm going to go ahead and pull this type out. Okay, so we have our addressing mode as an enum as well. So when we're creating these operands, then we can set the addressing mode, and then we can set either an immediate value or a register specifier. Well, that's not quite enough. We need base register as a register specifier. And we need index register as a T register specifier. Okay, so that should do it for the Chappy operand data type. Now we need to update our encoding method. So let's come back to the implementation of this bytecode. And in here, the first thing we want to do is encode our addressing mode for the first operand. So if we take a look, the very first thing we get is the addressing mode for the first operand. So that's what we want to encode first. So we're going to say operand one addressing mode. And that's going to be from operand one dot addressing mode. We need to do a shift left and we need the same shift constants that we had when we were decoding the instructions. Now I'm going to do a little bit of duplication here because I only need the shift constants. So I'm going to duplicate those up in here and we don't need those to be in the API section for any reason at all. So this is the operand one mode. We're going to shift left this time instead of right. 
And that's going to put that into the operand one addressing mode. So we'll say operand one addressing mode. And this is going to be a T register value uh, because no, it's not. It's going to be a uint32. And then we're going to come and take a look at the indices, these two indices, register indices. Operand one base register is a uint32. Operand one base register is going to be operand one dot base register. And then we're going to shift that left by this index amount. And then we'll do operand one index register. So this is going to be index register here. And we're doing index register shift left by operand register index two. So let's straighten all of these things up a little bit. Okay, so we've got those and then we also want to push in the same things for operand two. So we've encoded our two uh, operands now, including their registers if their registers apply. And then we want to add the opcode. So the opcode is already been being provided here. So we're just going to cast that. Uh, as a uint32 as needed. So the instruction is a uint32, and we'll say instruction is equal to uint32 of the opcode. So that gets us our opcode in the uh, last 10 bits. And let's go ahead and break this out. Each of these needs to be anded, or does it need to be ORed? It needs to be ORed. Okay, so our instruction now then is encoded as each of the operands ORed together with the opcode. So we're going to want to write our instruction, which is four bytes. We're up to four bytes here. But then we need to determine if we are going to write an immediate value as well. So let's take a look at which addressing modes need an immediate value. So obviously each of these immediates except for our special case. So if we come across the first three are immediate modes, then we definitely need to write an immediate value. And we simply don't, don't need to for register mode. So we're going to look at the immediate modes. So if I come and take a look at our addressing mode constant, we're going to say uh, case operand one dot addressing mode of and we literally only care about our immediate modes because they need an immediate value. So if we get any of those, I, mean, I guess I could do an if. Let's do an if. If operand one dot addressing mode in, and we'll have these three modes. Then begin. So what we actually need up here is a byte count. So we'll have byte count uint8. We don't really need it to be any bigger than 8. And we're going to set our byte count here to 4 bytes. So we'll say byte count is 4 bytes, or let's do size of uint32. So that covers our instruction. If we need to pass out an immediate value, then we're going to say byte count is byte count plus size of T register value. So that's going to give us the additional space for that. And then we also want to do the same thing for operand two. Now here we need to set the length of the result array that we're going to put our instruction into. So we've got set length result byte count. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and put this uh, initialization to zero in at the top here. If anything goes wrong, we can bomb out with zero bytes. And then we'll do byte count. Okay, so we're going to set the number of bytes that we need. And then we just need to move each of the pieces of data into the relevant location. Well, we can move from the address of instruction, so where have we got it? Instruction, into result uh, zero. 
size of unit 32. Okay, so then basically we do also need to do an if again on each of these addressing modes. So if operand one is in one of these addressing modes, I guess we need to calculate the offset into the array that we're going to put the value. So at this point, we'll put in array off. So array offset after we've done the first move. Uh, let's go ahead and put zero in before this move. So we'll initialize it up here. And then here it is. So this is going to be array off. That's going to give us our offset. And then we're going to put that array offset. We're going to increment it by size of u in 32. So that's going to bring us into the correct location to move our first addressing mode value into. So here we're going to do move operand one dot immediate value into our result array at array off size of t register value. Okay, and then we also want to increment our array offset by size of t register value. And then we're on to operand two, where we do essentially the same thing. But we're moving operand two's immediate value into the array at that offset. And we don't need to do an increment because there's nothing more to encode. Okay, so I believe that should that should encode our instruction as long as we supply the correct parameters. Now this prototype has changed, so I need to come up here and make the correct adjustment. And what do I have here? Handle add register A. Okay, so our add handler, our addition handler needs to be modified. I'm going to currently comment that out just to make sure that we have our encoding working. Okay, so I did say that changing the data type for this would change how we index our registers, but that's an easy fix. Uh, let's come up and find the register array and make this a T register specifier as the index. So let's see if that builds. Uh, we do have, so we need to cast that as a uint8 wherever we use it uh, for register indexing. Or do we? So I've got register index. I could make that a register specifier as well. So we would have to cast as register specifier. I think that would be clearer. So we'll do that. T register specifier. And we have here, this all needs to be cast as a T register specifier. And we're going to need that in a few places. So let's see where the compiler complains. Okay, and it looks like I had a typo on some of my variable naming here. So let's go ahead and fix that up. Now, why does it not like this? We want this to be a uint32 casting of that value. Let's see if that's, no, it wants me to cast the addressing mode itself as uint32 so it can do the shift. Okay, so now when we encode the halt instruction, it's complaining because it's expecting an array of operands, or rather I was providing an array of operands, it's now expecting two operands. So what we really need for this encode method, I guess we need some null operands and we need to define them so that we can pass them in. So what would a null operand look like? Well, you'll remember that the addressing mode for a null operand is going to be the implied mode. So we'll say const, C null operand is a T chappy operand, and that is a record. And we set addressing mode, and we'll set this to T addressing mode dot immediate. So that's going to give us our immediate addressing mode. Let's see if that compiles. This operator should not be an assignment. And I think actually it's a colon for this kind of constant. Yes. 
Okay, so what we need now is we'll take that, in fact, I'm going to make that all one line. And then we'll take that null operand and provide it for each of the parameters that are missing. So our halt instruction has a null operand and a null operand. Our NOP has null and null. Alert has null and null. The move operation, well, this is op move. And its operands are going to be operands one and two from the parameters. So I'll change the add instruction to accept two operands. And I'll change it from this array to operands one and two, like I did for the move instruction. And then we're going to have to go and fix the handler for that. Now that also means that I need to propagate those changes from here up into the interface section and into our interface. Okay, so then if we come and take a look at our handler for that and our addition instruction up here, it's going to look a lot like our move instruction, frankly. So we're going to take this move instruction and copy paste that into addition, but our result, our target, should be equal to target plus whatever value we obtain from the source. So that's going to accumulate on the target. So that should support all addressing modes just by doing that. And then we need to fix our main program. So we've got our upload. And we actually need to give this an operand now rather than just the values. So what we should be able to do is t chappy operand, uh, t chappy operand, and then we should be able to provide this as a constant, I think. So we'll say addressing mode, t addressing mode dot. And let's do an immediate value because that's what we had before. And then we're also going to put in, which, uh, it may not understand this. So uh, let's go ahead and write the code and then see what we need to fix. Uh, and then we're also going to put in our immediate value. And I need to take a look back because I forgot what I called it. Addressing mode immediate value. So our immediate value, colon, 0, 5. And I think that will work for the immediate load. And then we wanted to put that into our accumulator register. So we're going to specify the accumulator register now. Let's break this out so that it's a little cleaner. And for the second parameter, we want addressing mode is going to be AM register. And our base register is going to be, uh, what did I call it? T register specifier dot reg a for the accumulator. I think that's what we need. And then this ends the load instruction. And then we're going to do the same thing with the add instruction. And then we don't need a save instruction um, because we're not going to save this value anywhere. We're just going to make sure that the operation actually happens to the a register. And then we have our op halt. Now let's see if this builds. And it does not. It does not like my ah, upload for a start would be op move. And it doesn't like me using undeclared identifier addressing mode. So let's take a look at tchappy operand. And it certainly does have addressing mode. I'll just make sure I didn't typo that. OK, so the reason that it's not letting me do this is because I'm trying to declare this um, as a, a constant effectively. And it doesn't like how I'm declaring it. So guess what we need is some overrides. We need the ch chappy operand to have some methods for generating the operands. And I don't believe we can put those methods after this variable. So what I'll do is put them up in here. Okay, so we've got two methods here, and basically we want to do result dot addressing mode is addressing mode. So that there gives us two constructors that we can create our operands with. So let's come back and change this. This is going to be tchp operand dot create.
number, we're going to change our immediate value to 2. So does that build? Not quite. What do we have? Overload. Ah, the overload needs to actually go before the static keyword. And there we go. So that is now building, and whoa, we've made a lot of changes to the code. And the only way we're going to know if this is working is by changing our hello VM to actually give us a feed out just like we did with the 6502 to tell us what's going on within the registers. Now, where are the registers stored currently? Well, they're in the Chappie state. So if we come and take a look at the Chappie state record, the Chappie state record is right here in with the Chappie CPU. So what I think I need to do is move the Chappie state record out of here and put it into the Chappie specific interface area where we've been defining everything else. So I'm going to go ahead and do that so that we can access it from our main source code. So that's our Chappie uh, CPU state going in. I'm just going to go ahead and take the region off of that now. So I'm going to go ahead and make these changes real quick to modify this out to display the registers. Okay, so all I really need now is a way of getting at the registers from this write registers method. Now the on handle instruction gives us access to the iVirtual CPU and to the memory buffer, but it doesn't give us access to the registers. And so what I need to do really is modify this handle instruction to give us a pointer to the state data. And we have this on instruction cycle event. So what I'm going to do is change this event handler and we're just going to put in const CPU state pointer and make it a vanilla pointer. And that's because this really doesn't apply to a specific CPU. The state record that we get back will be specific to our CPU. And so our handler will get that record and it needs to dereference it as from a virtual machine chappy here a T chappy state record. Well, it happens that I have a P chappy state in here. So if I come back into my hello VM, I can change my handler here. Now this is going to break the 6502 example, which I'll have to fix. But we can put in here CPU state PTR. And then we'll go ahead and copy this down. And hopefully now I've done enough, it does build. So we are going to try running this program and I don't necessarily expect it to work first time. We've done a lot of code changes here. But let's go ahead and see what actually happens. Error, the CPU entered an error state. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do some debugging to see what's going on here. Well, first of all, this opcode check is actually invalid at this point. Let's correct that. So we've got this check to see that the opcode is in a valid range. What this should be is opcode is higher than, and then we bring this check down after we've decoded the opcode right here because we're decoding it here. So let's go ahead and give that another run. And in here, somehow I've got uh, operand 2 is not 18, it's 10. So let's correct that. So that should be, I think, 1, 2. 
And let's see if that's correct. Maybe I got the constant incorrect and we'll try it. By, well, that's wrong. That says 10. I thought I just changed that. Ah, the, uh, <laughs> I've got duplicates of the constant. So uh, what did I change the other one to? It is, I put immediate instead of implied. Okay, and run it and let's see what we get. So as we run our CPU, we're going to get our first instruction is going to be the NOP instruction. And as I said, the registers aren't exactly printed out clearly, but that's our NOP instruction. Let's take out our breakpoints now and just see how well this does. So we run it and we got our alert instruction. And then we should have got a load instruction. We do have a value of five in our A register. And then if I run the next instruction, our addition has happened and we have a value of seven and then our halt should happen, and we exit out of the program. Okay, so a lot of changes there, and there are going to be probably one or two bugs in the decoding of the operands. I'm gonna go back in offline and make any fixes that are necessary, and if I find something that really needs pointing out, then I will point that out in an additional video uh, later to this one. But that is our virtual machine now with addressing modes. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell.